Okay, for tonight, our main speaker is Dr. Philomena Trindade. I said that correctly? Philomena Trindade. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, she's going to be uh, speaking on a practical approach to detoxification. Dr. Trindade is an internationally sought after speaker in functional medicine. She is a graduate of the Fellowship in Anti-Aging, Reju Reju Regenerative and Functional Medicine, and teaches in the Fellowship, a master's program, through the University of South Florida, as well as the Institute for Functional Medicine. After obtaining her BA degree in biology, she went on to complete a master's in public health in the area of environmental health and epidemiology, before starting medical school. She graduated first in her class in a family practice from UC Davis School of Medicine and did her residency training in family practice at UC San Francisco Santa Rosa program. She has been in clinical practice for over 16 years. Before starting her own practice in 2004, in functional medicine, she was the medical director of a nonprofit organization that catered to the underserved. She is currently very active in developing teaching programs in functional medicine in the USA, Latin America, and Europe. So let's welcome Dr. Filomena Trindade. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's especially a pleasure to be among like-minded people. Don't always get that lucky. So today I'm going to talk to you about detoxification, but really in a very sort of practical term, and um, give you a little bit of what I do, at, but in a way that all of us should be doing, I feel, because unfortunately we live in a very toxic world. And there's two questions that I often get asked by my patients. And number one is, how do you know what's responsible for my, for my symptoms and, that, and whether or not they're related to toxicity? And number two is, do I really need a detoxification program, doc? I mean, come on. Or is it just a bunch of, you know, hogwash? Well, the fact is that we really do because we are surrounded by toxins. And I think the most important thing to remember to do is to be very critical of everything you put on, your skin, your mouth, even the thoughts that you think, because they all are toxins to some degree or another, or they all produce hormones that our body then needs to be able to detoxify. And our body basically detoxifies things in the same way, or at least it tries to as much as it can. So really the question we want to ask is where are the toxins coming from? Because unfortunately, toxicity starts in the womb. We don't often think about that, but it really does. I want to talk to you about a study that I found really interesting. How many of you have heard about the Environmental Working Group? Or you go to their website? Great. So this was a study by the Environmental Working Group. It looked at 287 chemicals um, that they detected in umbilical cord blood of newborns. Of those 287, 180 of them were known to cause cancer either in humans or animals. 217 of them are toxic to the brain or the nervous system, and 208 have been shown to cause birth defects or abnormal development in animal testing. So to me, that was pretty profound. If you look at the CDC's fourth national report on human exposure to environmental chemicals, uh, they, they've tested 212 chemicals. They're all found in the blood of most Americans. Of those, I'm going to particularly talk about six that I think are really important for us to think about and try to avoid or um, be aware of how much exposure we're having to them and how much our kids are being exposed to them as well. So number one are PDEs, or polybrominated diphenyl ethers. How's that for a mouthful? So these are flame retardants, which are especially in a lot of kids' clothes, but in a lot of our clothing uh, in general. And they're known to build up in fat tissue, of course. They can cause damage to the nervous system, liver, and the kidneys. 
And they've also been implicated in sexual dysfunction and, and thyroid problems because they can interact or bind to a lot of our hormone receptors, which we really need to worry. And over dinner, we were talking about this, how important it is for men and women, but particularly for women because many of our toxins are estrogen-like or they can bind to our estrogen receptor. And they can even affect the way we would process our own estrogens or our bioidentical estrogens if we're using them. The other is bisphenol A. How many of you are aware of bisphenol A? Right, it's been in the public, we really know. My concern is bisphenol A, it's great that, it's, that we know all the problems with it. It's found in many plastics, right? Lining of your cans. And I think that uh, it, you know, there's quite a bit of literature around it and quite a bit of awareness. But one area that I find that we don't often think about, because I think in terms of plastic bottles, right, we can now look at the label and see whether or not it has bisphenol A. But what about all the other plastics? Can you think of how our food is handled and the amount of plastic that is used, and especially plastic wrap, for example, because plastic wrap is going to contain bisphenol A. It's cheap. Think of all the times it comes in contact with your food. And I'm not saying, you know, get rid of it and never use it, because, you know, you and I all live in the real world, right? But I'm saying avoid using it as much as you can. Use glass whenever you can. And if you have to use it as a cover, make sure that your food is far away from it where it doesn't come in contact with it. And never, ever, ever microwave in plastic, and especially covering it. And when you think... Of, I, I fly a lot, so I always think about this in, in the airplanes, because if you eat the food that's being served to you, it's been microwaved. And guess what it's been microwaved in? Plastic. Many times it's even handed to you, you know, in the plastic still warm from the microwave. So really, uh, be aware of it. Remember that bisphenol A is weakly estrogenic, so it's going to bind to your estrogen re receptor, and it's going to affect your, not only whether or not you're estrogen dominant or not, but things like breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and that sort of thing, or those type, what I call sort of hormonal cancers. What about perfluorooctanic oic acid? How many of you use nonstick pans? Oh, good. I'm impressed. Because, you know, no matter how much I talk to my patients about this, I find it so hard for them to give them up. And, you know, this is something I've had to do myself, and I think it's not that hard to give it up. You just have to be aware that things may stick a little bit more. But that affects your immune system, your liver, and even if you're using a high quality one, like, like Circulon. We hear a lot about how Circulon is a really good brand. Even, even that, you're still gonna have some of it sloughing off or coming into your, your food. So if you have to use it, use it for the shortest amount of time, get the best quality, but I prefer that you didn't. So what, then what the question I always hear is, what do you use? Well, you can still use stainless steel. Some argue that's not the best. Uh, but you can also use glass, right? And you can use, um, I can never say it right, but the cruciate um, line, which is crusade, which is really, uh, you can use cast iron, but actually that cast iron is covered with enamel. with enamel. So you can use that, but cast iron is great. And it brings a point that I see over and over again in my patients, which is low iron. And if you just test someone's serum iron, it may look normal. But what you really need to do is look at ferritin. And I'm really impressed that the American Academy of Family Physicians was actually the first to came out with an article and saying, you know, forget the serum iron, you really do need to be looking at ferritin because you can have a totally normal serum iron and not have enough iron, and you can measure that through a ferritin. Now, it can be argued a ferritin is an acute phase reactant. It can go up when there's inflammation. So if it's really high, you may not be able to use it as a guide. But if it's low, which is what I find in most of my patients, then you do need iron, and you want to get it in an absorbable form. So using a cast iron um, cooking cookware is perfect. What about acrylamide? How many of you knew that if you deep fry your food, you're getting acrylamide? Right? Great. Or even... Uh, it can be also in, in bread crusts. So just be aware of how many of these are you coming in contact with. Because especially with you know, acrylamide, not only is, a, is it a carcinogen, but it's also involved in neurological dysfunction and even cancer. And mercury. 
We know the most common way that you get exposed to it is seafood. I, I don't take patients off seafood because I think the benefits still outweigh the risks, but me, it means that you want to include other things in your diet that is going to help you get rid of the mercury, things like cilantro and chlorella. And you, you really want to try and balance that because the benefits, I think, are important too. So I don't eliminate fish from someone's diet, but I try to educate them about eating the healthiest sort of, of fish sources, like your sardines and your, and your salmon, and especially if they're wild. And what about methyl tert-butyl ether? It's a gasoline additive. It's um, not currently used in the United States, but it was for many years, and it's still around. And of course, it causes neurological damage and reproductive problems. And especially, you need to be aware of this, that you know, here I'm talking about also with um, exposure to secondhand smoke, but that applies to any of the toxins that I've talked about, that everything is sort of additive, and it's all about what else are you doing with your health, what other exposures do you have. And remember that these are just six, right? And um, you can get the article from the CDC's fourth national report on human exposure. It was written in 2010. It's on PubMed, and you can actually download it. So I really believe that the question is not, are we toxic, but rather, how toxic are we, and how are we going to, what are we going to do about it? Now, I truly believe that chronic disease really comes up or begins with that gene-environment interaction, right? That's what functional medicine is all about. It's not just what we have with our genes, and some would argue that that's not even necessarily the biggest uh, factor. If you look at Bruce Ames' work, he says, it's only about 25% genetic, and the rest is really environmental. It's what you bathe your genes in. But I really believe that it's that interaction that sets the stage for the chronic diseases that we're seeing. So what are some of the symptoms, or what are some of the, of the um, diseases that you would see in someone who has a high lo toxic load or has a lot of um, toxic burden? Well, this is most of the chronic diseases that we hear about, diabetes, asthma, Parkinson's, obesity. Uh, I always think of toxicity when a patient comes in that has a lot of sensitivities, right? My multiple chemical sensitive patient. Of course, I think we all think about that in patients of that sort. But I believe it's important to think about it in anyone. I think we're all toxic, and we should be really instigating a program in our lives that deals with that. And I'll go through that a little bit further down in my, um, in my talk. Because we, have, we all know with fibromyalgia and fertility and anxiety and depression that that's there, but it can be any, with really any symptom that you present with. And what I find more and more, especially with the increased rates we're seeing with autoimmune disease, I really believe that that's tied to toxins and also some you know, infections, especially some hidden infections. So it can influence the manifestation as well as the progression of chronic conditions. And more and more, we're seeing things in the literature tying toxins into diabetes. And how many of you had heard that? Oh, good, a few of you. Because I think that it's not just with respect to diabetes, but really what we need to be looking at is insulin resistance, right? The precursor diabetes or pre-diabetes. Because we know that there are some patients or some people, some of us, that are insulin resistant, and we may never develop diabetes, but yet we are going to suffer the consequences of it because what is the problem? Is it really the sugar? It's the insulin, right? I mean, we can argue, yes, sugar is gonna have some effects as well, but really it's the high insulin that doesn't work right, that can't get inside the cell to do the work that it needs to, to do that causes many of the symptoms or the problems we see, like neuropathy and that sort of thing. And that is definitely associated with toxins. There's been quite a few papers now in the last five years. But in the literature, we're starting to see that connection more and more established, even though many of our colleagues, especially in conventional medicine, still don't believe it because, unfortunately, it takes, what, 20 to 25 years before something is written, published over and over again before it's implemented. But that's why it's so great to see so many of you here and that we share the knowledge that we have. So this is just a few lists of some of the potential associations between toxins and diseases, you know, like allergies, ADHD, Alzheimer's, I had already mentioned Parkinson's before, and the immune problems as well as cancer, but even something like um, high blood pressure or kidney disease. 
things that most of my patients don't often think of being associated with toxins. I think it's, we're more used to thinking of it in terms of your chronic fatigue or your multiple chemical sensitive patient. But also think of it in osteoporosis, your peripheral neuropathy. And you know, I'm not going to talk much about the financial cost of toxicity, but there are now a few reports on this so that in terms of how we can keep our health care costs down, I believe that is something that we all need to be looking at or considering anyway. So what do we do? How do we handle it? You know, what's our approach? Well, to me, it's really been about functional medicine because it's the only chronic disease model that we have that to me makes sense. How many of you have heard of the Institute for Functional Medicine? Oh, good. So it was originally started by Jeff Bland. It has now grown into its sort of own identity. It has courses that you can take. And more and more we're seeing actually papers in the literature talking about functional medicine. So this is our functional medicine tree. And really what it rep represents is sort of our approach to chronic disease. And that is that it, in sort of conventional medicine, you really are very much an organ-based system, right? Which is great for acute care, horrible for chronic disease care. But that in conventional medicine, you're focusing sort of on the branches of the tree, whereas in functional medicine, we're looking at the trunk of the tree and the roots. It's about that gene-environment interaction. And what we believe is that it's through the genetic predisposition together with what you bathe your genes in, right, the environment that I mentioned it in, I mentioned earlier, together with these processes that we all possess as human beings, that can lead to dysfunction. And what we call our dysfunction are fu these fundamental <coughs> clinical imbalances. And if you take courses from the Institute of Functional Medicine, you'll notice that those have changed. The underlying clinical imbalances, you know, we try to group things, it's constantly evolving. But that basically asks some very important questions, I feel, which is number one, where does the symptom come from? And number two, which is antecedents. What keeps it going? And what are some of the triggers? What brings it on? And that together with, with what we call, that puts together what we call our matrix. So these core clinical imbalances make up a matrix that I actually use with every patient that walks in my door and it will look something like this, where you have your antecedents, triggers, and mediators, and then you have all of the different dysfunctions. And as patients come in, you can, especially a very complicated patient, you can look at all the symptoms and see, oh, what area of the matrix, you know, would that fall in? Because to me, the most important thing that we need to do in chronic disease, aside from all being aware of how things can fit together, is how do you connect the dots? Right? How do, do two or three seemingly unrelated things are really related? How do you put them all together and how do you find the root cause? And then what do you do about it? And you have great people here in the audience that already are very aware of that and know how to apply it. And the important thing here is that toxins can affect antecedents, triggers, mediators, and any aspect of the matrix. So someone can come in with a hormone problem that's due to toxins, right? They can come in with an autoimmune problem that's also due to toxins. So what are some of the symptoms? Some of you already know, right? It's fatigue, depression, headache, your cognitive problems, some neurological issues like balance problems, tremors, especially the people who have not been diagnosed, who've been through sort of the medical system. You know, they've been to Stanford, they've been to UCSF. They're told, yeah, you have a tremor. You don't quite fit into Parkinson's but it may be Parkinsonian-like, right? Or it's a tremor, we don't really know what it is. Think toxins. And you want to know, it's hard to try and figure out exactly what it's due to, but I think the more we take a prolonged history and really try to connect those dots and figure out, you know, what is going on with this patient? You know, do they have this chronic debilitating fatigue? You know, what are, are their mood changes? What did they used to be like before? Because it always amazes me how well our bodies can adapt, right? I mean, we have this incredible ability to adapt. And so many times we kind of forget how bad things were before. And then think of that too when your patients with recurrent headaches or muscle achiness and weaknesses. 
And I especially see that a lot in my athletes who all of a sudden come in and say, you know, I, my recovery is bad, or I'm sore a couple days later, or any of you that are, you know, if you work out a little bit more, you get really sore, think maybe a toxin, maybe a mitochondrial dysfunction, maybe your mitochondria is not as well as it should be. And then of course your infertility and hormone imbalances. So let's look at some of these toxins. I'm gonna start out with metals, because more and more we know that metals can also be associated with diabetes. And unfortunately, you know, we're exposed to metals through our air, right, through our water. How many of you still have amalgams in your mouth? Not too many. That's good. I think that's a really hard one for, for uh, most of us to, to, to consider because some of us have a lot. And it takes, uh, I believe, you know, really trying to eliminate mercury from your diet as well as dealing with your amalgams. But the most important thing and the one thing I see over and over again is amalgams being removed without you seeing a bio, being done by a, bio, by a biological dentist. And then right after that, patients presenting with these problems, chronic problems that nobody can figure out what it was. And I really think it was due to the mercury exposure while they were trying to take out the amalgams without preparing the patient first. So extremely, extremely important. Do you, do you ever think about mercury causing vascular disease? This is actually an article by Mark Houston, who um, Dr. Husband's talked about Frank Sinatra, who's one of my heroes. Uh, I also really like Mark Houston. He's done a lot of research. He continues to do it. He's very active. And so you have to consider also coronary disease could be due to mercury exposure because it, you can have mercury in terms of a load, a high low, toxic load, but it can also cause immune complexes. So you have to also think of what it's doing to your immune system. And you know, it, it never amazes, or it never ceases to amaze me how much flack I still get from my, from my patients, and even from dentists. You know, I've tried to educate who, the person who used to be my dentist, and this is something that, you know, just could, he could not get it through his consciousness, that, you know, it, it, yet they protect themselves, at least nowadays, right? Dentists are, are using, what do they use when you go see even your hygienist? Gloves and a mask. Right, but yet it's still so hard for some of them to believe how much damage it could be doing to us and its effects on heart disease. This is a study on childhood um, lead exposure and classroom behavior, and these studies are out there. It's not like we're pulling things out of a hat. What about persistent organic pollutants? What are they? Well, these are organic compounds that are really resistant to environmental degradation, but they stay in our environment. They can biomagnify in food chains, because what are we? We're sort of at the end of the food chain, right? So whatever we put in our mouths, whatever we eat, we're also eating whatever that plant or that animal was exposed to. And it can bioaccumulate. So some examples would be your pesticides, your even your pharmaceuticals. And then don't forget, I mentioned this, I alluded to this a little bit earlier about endocrine disruptor, disruptors. And I call them xenobiotics, right? But you can also, or xenoestrogens, because many of them are really fake estrogens. And they can affect the estrogen receptor and its activity. You know, they can be involved in cancer and in obesity. But this is an extremely important part right here. How many of you have heard about estrogen metabolism? Oh, good. So I truly believe that the high rates of cancer, even if you looked at, uh, for, for example, women who were using the synthetic estrogens, but can breast cancer in general is really due to how our body processes the estrogen, how it metabolizes it, and which of the three pathways it uses. There's more and more literature on this. And the problem is that many of these endocrine disruptors, toxins, right, they will upregulate one of those unhealthy pathways. And if you happen to have the genetic predisposition to use that pathway, then your risk of cancer goes way up. But as nature would have it, there are ways to bypass that. But I think it's really important to be aware of that. And I think every woman who uses bioidentical hormones should be tested for this and should be working at having it through the healthiest pathway. Because what we know is that we can use food and supplements to die, sort of divert the estrogen metabolism to a healthier pathway. 
And I talked about bisphenol A earlier, but there's also studies on bisphenol A and diabetes. So we really have to consider all these toxins that we're exposed to, but also not forget common things like dry cleaning, for example, right? Or even painting or driving a new car or putting carpet in your home. You know, all that smell, that's all off-gassing. And it doesn't mean you, know, you can never get dry clean. You can never dry clean your clothes again, but it means you're aware of it and you do the best you can to limit the contact with your skin. So you air it out. You use the dry cleaner that you've spoken with and you know what, what kind of chemicals they're using as much as you can. It's really all about education. And persistent organic pollutants I mentioned earlier in diabetes. So more and more, what are you seeing? We're seeing studies indicating all the different types of toxins causing diabetes and insulin resistance. And you know, how many of you know about Mark Hyman? So he's constantly talking about diabetes, right? So the relationship, because conventional medicine has, I think, done a really good job of talking about how obesity can contribute to or cause diabetes, right? But I believe it's the reverse that's the main problem, and it's one of the main reasons for obesity. Because I think it's that when you're insulin resistant, you're more likely to gain weight. And then you have to look at why are you insulin resistant, and that together with toxins, which could have been the cause of the insulin resistance, right? But it may have just been additive. So I think it's just really important. This is a study on dioxin and also it causing di type 2 diabetes. And then the, my main reason for putting this slide here was two things. One was to talk about I know it's a little bit of a busy slide, but it's talking about arsenic and its relationship also to insulin resistance, as well as some markers that we should all be asking our doctors to order or making sure we're, we're checking, like you know, our hemoglobin A1C and or CRP, and a marker that you know, all conventional labs do and most doctors don't really order or look at, especially since it got taken out of the comprehensive metabolic panel, which is DGT, that you can be used as a marker for how toxic are you or and how much is your body able to handle that, to that toxicity. Because that can kind of correlate with the amount of glutathione that your body's able to make. Might be a little bit more than you wanted to know, but I said it anyway. And then what about pesticides? Well, we know pesticides are non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, chronic fatigue. What about Parkinson's disease? And you know, this is studied in, in, in the literature. And you know, I've talked about metals, I've talked about persistent organic pollutants, but I think we can't forget the biological toxins. And you know, I'm just gonna briefly go over some of those. But we're, I'm talking about chronic infections, and sometimes they can be sort of chronic indolent, or you may not be aware that you have it until you unless you look for it. You may have symptoms that are nonspecific and you may not um, think of it. And I'm thinking like, uh, for example, a reactivated Epstein-Barr, your hepatitis B or hepatitis C. Uh, we heard about Lyme a little bit earlier. And I completely agree with the person who spoke. You don't need to use antibiotics. There's different protocols out there that you can use. And I think you really need to look at this total body approach. And mycotoxins and mold. And just today, it's funny that this happened today before I came. I had something... Uh, Happen, you know, sometimes you forget the real world. You know, I always say that if the more colleagues, the more like-minded colleagues that I have, I tend to forget how the rest of the world thinks. So I have a patient that I diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis, and there's a guy called uh, Dr. Ebringer. I don't know how many of you have heard of him, but he's out of England, and he studied the relationship between uh, bacteria in particular, Klebsiella and ankylosing spondylitis, and Proteus and rheumatoid arthritis, and how through molecular mimicry that can turn on sort of this autoimmune disease because you can carry, you can be a carrier, for example, for ankylosing spondylitis and never develop it. So I have a patient who uh, I diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis. I did her stool test and she had Klebsiella, four plus, very high, along with some other bacteria. So in the process of trying to treat it, we tried herbals, and she was just not really compliant. And she came back and she said, could you please just give me the antibiotics? 
And I've never done that. I have never given someone antibiotics for Klebsiella. But I did it because she asked me, and I always, you know, I believe in really doing the best for your patient and that, you know, I can educate them, but if they're having a hard time, it's my job to really try and meet them where they're at, too. So I said, okay, Tammy, I don't really agree with it, but if that's the only way and that's the only thing that's going to get you better and you're suffering, okay, as long as let's go through and look at the side effects and we'll pick the least of all evils. And, and then she said, you know, um, my husband, it's not that he doesn't believe you, but he really wants that diagnosis from, you know, like a specialist. I said, okay, so where do you want to go? I said, well, I've been to Stanford and I didn't really like them. For, she went there for a different reason. Um, I didn't know how, like, she didn't like how she was received, so she goes, I like to go to the UCSF uh, Ankylosis Spondylitis Clinic. So I said, okay. So I wrote her the referral. They were, they were very specific. They wanted more information, so I, I sent them to them. Today, when I was getting ready to come here, I got a call from the doc that was seeing her. Very irate. Why did I have her on ciprofloxacin? Did you think you're going to cure her, her ankylosing spondylitis? And I said, no. I was actually treating, you know, the information, the, inf the infection that she has in her gut. And she said, but Klebsiella, you should be using Augment. And I said, well, maybe I can just send you a copy of that because it was, happened to be resistant to that bug, right? And then, I probably shouldn't have said this, but you know me, I was trying to get, you know, a little bit of information out there, see if we can share. I, I, I had this belief that if we can agree on the, on the scientific literature, right, that, you know, you, for example, can believe something completely different from what I believe, but if we can at least have some common ground, we can educate each other, we can uh, help our patients, right? And so I said, well, have you heard of Dr. Evans's work? Oh, my God. She went off. She started yelling and said, there is absolutely no scientific evidence to what he's saying. You know, basically she was saying he was a quack, but she didn't quite get that. And I said, well, I've looked at his studies, and, you know, my, I have a public health background, and I actually thought some of his studies, you know, have merit. Oh, she would not hear of it. She just started yelling and said, you know, she went back to that I was trying to treat ankylosing spondylitis with... with um, and they're biotic, and I said, no, but let me just, uh, I said, I don't want to argue with you, but I really want you to help my patient. That is why I sent her to you. You're the expert. I really want to know, do you think she has ankylosing spondylitis? And I'm happy to send you, email you that report. Could you please give me your email address? And she did. So I sent it. But it just, you know, sometimes when I'm dealing with other docs that think like I do, and even when I lecture, you know, I forget that even when we're trying to meet in the science, there's some people who will dismiss it. And so there's some people that you can't educate, right? It's like you can drive a horse to the water, but you can't necessarily make the horse drink. But we can try, and I am the eternal optimist. So other infections, H. pylori, they're extremely important. I recently read an article about H. pylori and infertility. So H. pylori is extremely important bacteria that I think causes a lot more problems than we initially thought and one that I'm seeing more and more. And I think I'm seeing it more and more because we have such a problem with overuse of proton pump inhibitors, right? Your Prilosec, I mean, it's over the counter. That's gonna lower your stomach acid, it's gonna allow H. pylori to grow or reproduce. So I think it's really important. And then also chlamydia and cardiovascular disease, which you don't, I talked about metals causing heart disease, but we also need to think about the infections that can do that. And don't forget about endodontic infections. Extremely important. And sometimes can be kind of hidden. You know, you can have a uh, periodontal disease and not necessarily know, but important to really look at that. And now we have studies on that. And what about electromagnetic radiation? And electromagnetic fields and dirty electricity, right? Well, at least with the dirty electricity, you, there are th blockers, things you can use. I feel like the other electromagnetic radiation may be a little bit more difficult with all the Wi-Fi's that we have nowadays. So what are some of those sources of what are called dirty electricity? Smart meters, right? Your plasma TV, your cordless phone, your RI phone, very high emitter. I was at a conference and I got called by a patient and I went outside and I was using my, my cell phone and this colleague of mine actually practices in, in um, Santa Cruz uh, had a 
counter and was following me around and he was showing his students just how much of an emission it has. So it's really important that we limit that so we don't put it up to our brains as much as we can. You know, we try to use the speaker. And, and I've been hearing now about um, some things you can attach to your phone that will actually block it. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. But this one on here I have a hard time with too, which is energy efficient light bulbs. Because, you know, a few years ago, before I knew that, I went and I changed all my light bulbs and my parents to the energy efficient ones. And then I read about this and I said, oh. And even your treadmill. So you, we just have to be really conscientious about where we're getting exposures from. Because especially with, with in this case, dirty electricity, we want to think about thyroid, which is exceptionally susceptible. But also the other things we've been talking about, like multiple sclerosis and cancer, asthma, diabetes, but especially sleep disruption. You know, I see a lot of sleep disruption due to sleep apnea, but also a lot of it due to dirty electricity and electromagnetic fields, which is you know, one of the harder ways to diagnose, the harder things to diagnose. And of course, your chronic pain and also your migraine headaches. But it's pretty amazing now the studies that we have about electromagnetic exposure and, even, and cancer risk. And we also have some of these studies, like I mentioned earlier, in classrooms. And of course, cellular phones, which I already talked about. And one of the highest emitters, actually, they believe it or not, are baby monitors. So I think it's just really important to know. And wouldn't you know it, dirty electricity also effect, is correlated with diabetes and sugar regulation. So what can we do? Well, we can get counters. Brittle is, Brittle is difficult to control. So basically when the blood sugar keeps going up and down and you can't do much to manage it. So you can get a, a switch. I actually got mine from Canada. It was easier. You can count it. In other words, you can get one that you go around and plug and see where the highest emitter areas are of your home. And then you can put a blocker. Like I have several of the blockers in my office. And then, you know, I, I didn't mention this here, but I think it's also really important to think about our air and purifying our air and really trying to get the cleanest air that you can, you know, where you're at and using air purifiers, including plants. Mm -hmm. So what about psychospiritual? It affects the matrix. There's all, you also have to think of it as toxins. So toxins in terms of, you know, are you in a toxic relationship? Right? It contributes to the total toxic load and also how your body handles toxins. And even when you're not thinking about toxins. Let's say we're just thinking about stress hormones, right? Well, those need to be metabolized. That's going to add, in a sense, to your toxic load, too. But also, how your patient is, is coping with what's going on in their life, right? What's their belief systems? What kind of trauma have they had? Those are toxins, in a way, that need to be dealt with. We need to look at the total person. So, as I say, physical, psychological, and spiritual. And lifestyle, you know, what other things are patients being exposed to? You know, we seem to take alcohol on pretty lightly, but it is a toxin, right? Just like smoking and also, you know, our water, really trying to get the cleanest uh, water that we can. Because there's a slide later on that's going to talk about this, but do you know that because we were using some of our water, that all of us, if we're not filtering our water against it, we're all being exposed to statins and antidepressants? And I, I find it that it's not easy to get our patients to change, right? So I was looking for how can I be most effective, especially working in a nonprofit. I really like Dr. Prochesca's work, that Change for Good. You know, I, I like the way he goes through and says you have to assess the patient at what stage they're at and then try and make change. It's just like the same way we can do that with our families and with our colleagues. Heart rate variability, how many of you have heard of it or use it? Great. I love heart rate variability. You know, for years I was working on helping patients cope with stress. And then my question was always, how do I know I'm really helping them? How do I know it's really affecting their disease progression or their susceptibility to disease? So when I came across heart rate variability, I was cloud nine because this is one way that you can not only, you can use it, to measure their heart rate variability, but you can also use it to measure whether or not the treatment that you're doing works. And what I've found is that 
it's different for different people. So heart rate variability measures the beat to beat variability of our heart. The more stressed we become, the less variability there is. The higher risk of diabetes, heart disease, depression. Now I was giving a lecture on this and I was talking about heart disease and diabetes. And then I had three people in the audience that were part of the same practice and they were all psychiatrists. And they just stood up and said, you know, we're be we've been using it in our practice because there's so much literature now on heart rate variability and depression, how well correlated it is. And so you can use the machine to see, and it's a small little machine, you put it on your ear to measure the heart rate variability, and then you can see what works best for each patient because we're all different, right? For me, diaphragmatic breathing works really well. For other patients, it can be thinking of uh, petting their dog or a, their favorite sort of special place. But anyway, it's a pretty inexpensive way that you can use. It's recommended that you do it every day for five minutes and then once a week you do it for 15. And it tells you when you're sort of in the zone. So I think the question we all need to ask is what else? What, what else could I be exposed to? Where else could I be getting toxins from? This is what I was talking about with the water before. How there's you know pharmaceuticals in most of our water. But also what about our food? In every aspect of what the food has been through before it made it to our table and to our mouths, right? And what about high fructose corn syrup? It's almost impossible to find a drink in the United States without high fructose corn syrup. And now that they're trying to change it to corn, is it corn sugar or corn syrup? And you know, it's amazing because you know I have a clinic in Europe, and so I spend half the time there. And Europe has been very uh, against using high fructose corn syrup, and, and they've succeeded. But it's funny how the, I st I'm starting to see it kind of creep into the market under these other names. Same thing with like NutraSweet and Splenda. And aspartame. So don't forget about all the other additives because many times you'll have a food that will say light. You know, like you can have light olive oil, right? But when it says light and it's a, like a juice or even candy, uh, think it's light because they've probably added one of those, either aspartame or NutraSweet or Splenda, which is a really common one that you see now. And what about genetically modified foods? You know, someone else is going to be talking about it, so I'm going to be really brief, but I, I'm just shocked at what's going on now with genetically engineered salmon and how it looks like it's going to happen and how people can't think of what you're, you're giving a hormone or you're making sure that this, you're modifying it so that this fish or the salmon has high levels of growth hormone and then we're going to be ingesting that and it's not supposed to affect us with all that we know about how food interacts with our genes? Well, you just said that was the, that you You know, we're really the overweight and undernourished society. And it, it begins, you know, with the uh, sort of amount or, or the micronutrient density and the macronutrient density, but also, too, about, you know, do you ever watch people eat? What do they usually do? Thank you. Who said that? It's like two, three chews or none, and then they swallow. And. <laughs> do you know how difficult and you know how difficult it is you know when I first started doing this I, I believe in doing everything to myself that I do to my patients you know within reason but if I'm going to give a patient an IV I'll try it on myself first see what side effects I get because you know I'm supposed to know that stuff and so when I really started thinking about this I'm like you know I'm becoming more that way I've always been the last person to leave the table all my friends hate me because of that and I always say that's my upbringing you know I'm a foreigner so and, and that's one thing I cannot change even in medical school and residency I would eat less but I couldn't eat faster but you know after a while I kind of you, know, you kind of adapt unfortunately so when I made myself chew 30 times you know what the most I, thing I noticed was the feeling of it on my tongue and how it was like, yuck. But then you have to think, wait, if it's feeling that way, that means that my cells are going to see a lot more of the nutrients that I have in there. You know, it's kind of like having to tell my nephew, 
that he has to brush his teeth before he goes to bed. If he doesn't, all these bacteria or monsters like him are going to be in his mouth while he's asleep. And you know how kids can just imagine, you know, all that stuff. But, you know, you have to pretty much be conscious of what you're doing. And I really believe in the power of perception. And also, too, of, of what you put out there is what you, you receive. And to really focus on, okay, I'm doing this because I want the maximal absorption. And if I focus on that, that's what's going to happen. So what really are we eating? You know, I, I'm just amazed when I looked at these statistics. Because this says that the average American is eating 29 pounds of french fries per year and drinking 53 gallons of soda. Now, I don't eat any french fries, unless maybe I made them in the oven. And I don't drink soda. Nobody in my family does, my immediate family. So you know what that means? Somebody out there is eating triple, and drinking triple of that. You know, a, a couple of years ago, we went to Hawaii with my best friend and her family. This is my best friend from high school. We've maintained in contact, but, and I go to her house, she comes to my house, but we hadn't lived together, right? So we, we rented this um, condo, and the first thing we do is, you know, we were in Kona, we went to Costco, and we're picking things up, because, you know, we were trying to be reasonable, and, and uh, we were cooking as much as we could. And also, too, because, you know, you, I have a lot of food sensitivity, so I have to watch what I eat. So we each got a little cart, you know, and we were getting to, to pay, and, my, and I looked at their cart, and I'm like, oh my God, but I didn't say anything, and I was trying to not let it show, and my husband looks at me, and he goes, do you see what they have in their cart? Because it was soda, and it was the coffee, you know, those um, Starbucks coffees, right? And it was all this processed food that we just don't eat. And I thought, oh, oh okay, we gotta do some educating here. And sometimes it's, it pays to be a little bit subtle. I think pay, people listen a little bit more. And so what are we not eating? You know, a, a big campaign that I had a few years back when I was working in a nonprofit was trying to get all the farm working kids and their families, but especially the kids, to eat more fruit, right? Fruit and vegetables, and we're really focusing on that. And the sad part is when you look at the statistics, even though there's been all this focus and emphasis on it, we're, we're eating less. We're eating less than what we used to. That's the number one thing I notice, you know, in Europe, is that after dinner, after lunch, nobody gets up the, from the table without eating fruit. And it's kind of unheard of here. Now, I like to say fruit, fruits and vegetables, and I really focus on my patients eating, you know, 9 to 11 servings, which is not easy, but once you get used to it, it's really not... I mean, you, you, your body starts to crave it, and you know you really need it, and that's the right thing to do. And then remember about what are some of the altered characteristics of our food today? Because we have to think about both the macronutrient and the micronutrient composition. Also the changes in fatty acid, right? All our meats are much more omega-6 than omega-3, and some of that was done on purpose to have the meat really tender, right? That's why we feed our, our cattle corn, but it's also because it's cheap. And the fiber content, you know, we, the fiber content has really decreased. Not to mention the glycemic load. And, you know, we talk about glycemic index, but I think the glycemic load is even a better indicator. And then your our sodium potassium ratios are off. And I really believe that has a lot to do with partially with the increased rates of atrial fibrillation and arrhythmias that we see. And then your acid base balance. These are just some of the top insufficiencies that you can see, like heart disease with calcium, magnesium, and zinc. And what are the main problems with some of the blood pressure control medications that we use, for example. They deplete exactly just those, particularly magnesium, and magnesium is such an important nutrient. You know, the, supposedly the number one deficiency in the U.S. in terms of minerals is zinc, but in my practice, I see it more as magnesium, and I measure everybody. I think it's just everybody's magnesium deficient, and it's really hard to then get it inside the cell. Because you can take magnesium, but whether or not it's actually being absorbed and getting into the cell is a different story. So what's my approach? What do I do with all of this? Well, I use my matrix. I use the functional medicine matrix, because I think that's the best that I have for chronic disease. And I try to connect the dots and figure out these presenting complaints. How do they all fit together? 
You know, how could they be the underlying root cause of what's going on? And you can have more than one thing going on with a patient. But what has amazed me the most is that I have had, you know, I've worked in the third world, I've worked in several different countries, I have had to learn to see, you know, whether a baby was breached or, or your head was down or was not, you know, with my hands when I had no tools. You know, I've had to diagnose pneumonia without having, you know, my stethoscope. But those are the things that, that really helped me, I feel like, become a doctor. Because it's, sometimes you have to take away all the technology and everything else and see, what can I do just me, just with the tools that I have? And looking at physical exam, what someone's hair looks like, what their skin is like, their pallor, you know, how well hydrated are they? What does their tongue look like? Because that's a big sign of B vitamin deficiency. I have to, and, and looking at someone's nails, for example, you can see whether they're zinc deficient or whether they're, they have low uh, stomach acid. I have to say that that has probably been the biggest tool to help my patients be compliant. Because if I can just look at them before I have any labs and I use functional medicine tools and I say, this is what I think is going on. This is the story that you have told me and this is what your body is telling me. Now I could be right and I could be wrong, but let's get some labs and then we'll decide whether I'm right or wrong. And then when the labs came back and they're pretty much what I said, patients are like, wow. In many cases they'll say, you know, I always kind of suspected that, but I never said it because nobody would believe me. Because I really believe that intuitively, you know, patients know a lot of times what's going on, but so many times they've been told they were wrong or they can't think that way or that, you know, the pain in their head is not related to the pain in their toe that they've kind of given up, unfortunately. And I, in detoxification, I especially look for meth poor methylation because I think that's essential. I think glutathione and methylation are some of the two main things. Of course, you have to look at the whole detoxification pathway, but those two are ones that I think we can easily sort of figure out even based on, on family history. So I ask, is there alcoholism in your family? Is there depression, schizophrenia, or bipolar depression, or ADHD? Has anybody committed suicide? Is there autism? You know, are you always constipated? These are all signs that you can look for, that you can start to put things together. I also use a lot of questionnaires because they help me not necessarily just diagnose, but follow patients. Because I said earlier that we have this incredible ability to adapt, right? And so if it's a patient that has several different things going on, many times they forget just how sick they were. And they're like, but doc, I'm still not better here. And then we have to look and say, okay, but you're better there and there and there, and this is what we're going to go next. Because unfortunately, we can't just take a patient who's taken 50 years to get to the illness they have today and in two days or three days or two weeks or even two months, change it. And sometimes it takes more than just the food and supplementation. Sometimes we have to go to IV therapies. And it's really about all the disruption that has already happened to their biology. And I do a really detailed history and physical as I already mentioned. You know, I look for as many clues as I can in the history and the physical and that I can associate sort of with, with dysfunction. I use the matrix. And then I, I basically start a nutritional lifestyle plan based on that, but I order the studies to either disprove or to prove what I already believe. And I'm always constantly learning. As I tell my patients, either, you know, either I could be wrong, and if I do, you and I are going to learn something together, or if, or if I'm right, we'll just build on that knowledge, and we'll keep going. I use the elimination diet on every patient that comes in. How many of you have heard of an elimination diet? Oh, great. So I use the one from the Institute. It eliminates the five most allergenic food groups and then some that you can add. So those would be gluten, dairy, corn, soy, and the nitrate vegetables. And I adapt it for each patient because, you know, someone may not have signs that they need necessarily to be off the nitrate vegetables. And also, too, because if it's, you know, I spend a lot of time educating patients on that. And if it's too much for them to do, you have to kind of tailor it to the patient. We may just do gluten and dairy, for example. Or what I find is that the patient may say, you know, I can only do one thing at a time. And by the time I go through and teach them, you know, how they're going to change their cupboard and they're going to be prepared and they give them their grocery list, they'll say, you know, they'll call me and say, this isn't so bad. I think I can do all three or all five at the same time. But I, I think it's really important to, even if you don't think you have toxins, to at least go through a month where you do the elimination diet and then you reintroduce and you see, am I reacting? Is this, you know, am I reacting to that? Because that could be lowering your immune system or your ability to fight infection. 
And then I try to reduce toxin exposure as much as possible, try to identify it, and then reduce it. You know, beginning from what goes in their mouth to the thoughts that they think to what you put on your skin, and with women especially with makeup, and I'll go through that in a little bit later. And then I address and tailor exercise to each patient because if I'm doing a detoxification program that's pretty intense, you have to really limit. Uh, in, some, in some patients, you may want to limit their exercise. The most important thing is that you address it individually. And then I, I focus on stress reduction in every patient and the mind-body-spirit equilibrium. Because it's amazing how many patients will tell me when I ask, you know, do you have an aha? Do you do something every day that you really enjoy? What do you think the most common answer is? No. Or I don't know what makes me happy. Or I don't know what I can do every day that I would really enjoy, even if it's just for five minutes. But, you know, that's their homework. And they'll figure, we'll figure it out together. And I, and I really believe that there's some nutrients that we all need. I talked about magnesium earlier. And then with my detoxification pro protocol, I do something called sequencing, which is, you know, I, I really try to not just assess their burden, but also their preparation, their ability to do it. And I take them through this preparation phase. And then their active phase, and then I reassess what's going on, and then and their maintenance, what they're going to be on pretty much possibly the rest of their lives, maybe not. It depends on what symptoms they have and what diseases they have. But you really want to start looking as much as you can their ability to detoxify, whether it's environmental, dietary, metabolic, or infectious, all these things we've been talking about. And for that, you know, the Institute of Functional, Management, of Functional Medicine has some questionnaires that we can use. Plus, you're going to use your laboratory results. I already talked to you about heart rate variability. There's one other thing I use in my office in every patient, and that is a bioimpedance analysis, or basically a body composition analysis. And that's really helpful, especially when doing detoxification, because you can measure fluid shifts. And so if I don't have a, a genetic profile on this patient, for example, to see how well they're able to handle toxins, which gives me an idea how quickly I can detoxify them, I can, I can look at fluid shifts, right? Because our bodies, our cells, like to keep most of the water inside. But if I'm detoxing somebody too fast, they will lose water from inside the cell to outside the cell. Because, as Robert Rakowski says, the power to, the, to sol the solution to pollution is dilution. And so you can use it to also gauge, something you can easily do in your office. And then you want to ask, you know, what is their food and nutrition status, you know, in terms of how whether their body look, and then you also are going to do labs. And what about sleep huh, and rest? Do they really know how to, to, rex, to rest and relax? And are they getting a restful sleep? Exercise and movement I already talked about, and then their relationships with others, and, you know, meaning and purpose. Do they have meaning and purpose in their life? So we try to identify toxic sources as much as possible. And that includes, you know, house cleaning, you know, what kind of of uh, cleaning supplies do they use? Do they have a lot? Because with every chemical that they can give me, I can find an alternative that is non-toxic, including vinegar for your windows, for example, baking soda, then your silverware. You can use essential oils. They're great for your, for your shower, even just a few drops diluted with water. Because you really want, you really need to be aware of all of all the possibilities where those toxins are coming from and what can we do to combat them. And I think cosmetics is one really big one. It is, we now have a few companies out there where you have cosmetics that are free of glandulars and talc and all these other chemicals and then preservatives that you don't want to be putting on your face. But more often than not, those are, those are difficult. You, you don't have a lot of options. And you have to become a really smart consumer and read the label and really see you know, what is in all these different personal uh, items that you're using? For example, you know, I have patients that will come in and they'll say, oh, I'm, I'm using um, mineral makeup and I know it's, you know, it's great, you don't need to worry about it. And I say, no, I want you to bring it in, I want to look, because many times they'll put fillers in there and they'll put talk, which you don't want on your skin, especially when you consider the amount of time, you know, that we'll have makeup in our face, which is what? Sometimes 16, 24 hours a day, some, some, some women may not even remove it properly when you go to bed, so you have to take all this into account. And then about the standard American diet, which I already talked a little bit about, and the fact that you know, we're supersizing everything. 
and also looking at the toxins that can be in our foods and what are they coming from? You know, from farming to how you store them in your refrigerator or how you freeze them and really trying to limit the amount of plastic, uh, of contact with plastic. You know, I, um, I always tell my patients how a few years back, I pretty much got rid of all the plastic containers in my house and I started using a lot of glass. And I use a lot of mason jars, so I also can, so that was easy. Um, and the first thing I heard is, oh, but you can't put them, you can't freeze them. And I said, oh yeah, you totally can. You can freeze your, your glass jars. You know, I even make sure all my patients have a, a one liter glass bottle for their water. It's a little bit heavier, but hey, you know, you'll get used to it instead of having to use a plastic bottle. Also because too, what happens when you leave a plastic bottle of water in your car? The sun, it will get hot, even in the winter time. Right? And what happens when it gets hot? It will leach things out. And what if you happen to have put some lemon in there? It will leach out even more because it's acidic. It will bring things out. So all these things you, you have to really be aware of. And you really want to do as much as we can to sort of um, nourish our organs of detoxification. And, and that really begins with the food and what we're putting in our mouth. And you want to try and remove as much as you can of what I talked about triggers earlier. Really of what triggers and also of what keeps things going and how things can become additive in terms of your, your total exposure, your total body exposure. And don't forget about the psychological factors and your hormones that then also influence, of course, your stress level and gives your body more chemicals that it has to detoxify. And stressors come in many types, right? They could be social, I mean, financial, it can be work, friends and family, it can be even illnesses. And we mentioned a little bit about cortisol early, and I think it's really important to realize that cortisol, which is the stress hormone, also has to be detoxified, just like it's a toxin, and so does our hormones. And it, for me, it's essential. Any time I'm going to start a detoxification program that we address the gut, and I really start with the gut first. I use the 4R program, which basically stands for the four R's, is what do you need to remove, what do you need to replace, how are you going to repopulate, and how are you going to repair and then rebalance the gut. And it's, uh, it's also through the Institute of Functional Medicine. But I find that coming back to the gut, no matter what step you're at in your detoxification program, is really important. And the elimination diet I already had talked to you about. And how many of you know about the difference between gluten sensitivity, gluten intolerance, and celiac disease. Oh, good. So I love Dr. Lester Fasano. And um, if you haven't heard of or read his article in the Scientific American, 2009, where he actually showed how a problem in the gut can predispose you to then having an autoimmune disease. And he's gone on now to publish papers on differentiating the difference between a gluten sensitivity, celiac disease, and even a gluten intolerance. And what he says is, if it's, if it's a sensitivity, it means that the gliadin molecule may cause an inflammation in your gut, but it won't cause necessarily increased permeability, but it'll cause more inflammation. If it's an intolerance, you actually have inflammation and you have increased permeability. So you have gap jun the junctions, the gap junctions, you have basically a leaky gut, and what's on the other side of those cells? 70 to 80% of our immune system, right? So if you have a leaky gut, things are going through and your immune system is seeing and reacting to that normally it wouldn't see. So you really need to take that into account because, you know, I still have a lot of my colleagues talking about, well, but this person didn't have celiac. I'm like, well, it's great that they don't have celiac, but that's not the issue. The issue is, are they intolerant to gluten? And, you know, right now it's difficult to talk about allergies because... You know, supposedly an allergy is only IgE. So if you have a food sensitivity that's IgG mediated, you have to call it an intolerance. So we just have to adapt the language, especially when we're speaking to our colleagues. But the good news is that phytonutrients, right, the nutrients you can find in your food, in your fruits, in your vegetables, can help with detoxification. And we have studies showing that. And so what phytochemicals do you want in your diet? as many different colors as you possibly can. But I especially really like seeing the reds and the greens and the purples, right? You really want it in all different, I always say all colors 
possible, but especially your greens. Like, I grow a lot of kale. I eat a kale every day. And I pass plants on to my patients, and I tell them, you know, kale is so, so important. And the same thing with, for example, blueberries, which it's not, you can't always necessarily find them year-round, right? But when the season is right, you can freeze them. I do believe there's something about eating, you know, for the season. I mean, there's reasons why certain things only grow at this time of the year, for example. But I think it's also important to give your body as much as you can to help with detoxification. So we'll go through a list and, and a food plan as to what you want to include. About your proteins, you know, your oils, all, and all the different phytonutrients that you want to include. Very specifically, I give lists of vegetables and fruits. And especially when you're dealing with a patient who, for example, you know, has a detoxification problem or an issue related to a toxin, but in addition has diabetes, which we know could be due to the same cause, you have to worry about blood sugar, so you have to be very specific about what fruits, for example, they can and cannot have or what they should or shouldn't. And then organic whenever possible, knowing that, you know, there's the dirty dozen, which are things that you should all always buy organic like blueberries and nectarines and apples and grapes and collard greens and kale. And then there's those things that you can sort of skip out on, as I, I always say it, or the Clean 15, which you can buy conventional that are not necessarily organic, especially if, you know, finances are an issue. And then you want to try and include as much as you can in terms of organic superfoods. Things like, you know, inulin and ginger and all the different spices and herbs. You know, grow a herb garden and, and Start to see what does your palate like? What is the herbs that you can include in your smoothies? Or in, you can even make tea from them or put them in your salad, especially in your salad. I find that most people eat a very bland, what I consider a very bland salad. So I ask them, you know, put some cilantro in there. Put some basil. You can grow it. And, you know, add spinach, add cabbage. And look at all the different studies that have shown how important that is and how that food is going to be talking to our genes. And then also... All year, you know, I'm sure all of you have heard about your goji berry and how important uh, the antioxidants from it are. And, uh, and we now have studies showing how important it is, especially for neural protection. And see buckthorn the same way. It actually, actually lowers inflammation. And lichenberry, you know, some of these were things that until I started looking at the studies, I really didn't even know existed. But we live in a country where we can find just about anything. And then don't forget about fiber and how important it is in removing toxins from your body and how we should be getting at least 20 to 25 grams. And then one thing I didn't mention here that I think is really important is using a detox broth with your patients. And of course, hydration. So, so important to make sure they're drinking plenty of water. And really focus on those magnesium-rich foods. Like I have my patients eat Brazil nuts because they're very, they're one of the, high, the nuts with the highest amount of magnesium. Plus, they also have zinc and selenium. So you're getting three main minerals just right there. And three nuts a day, you get over 150 micrograms of selenium. So you can't argue with that. And then really talking about you know, protein, leaner sources of protein, making sure that you're getting enough protein, because in order to detoxify, you need to have some protein. Now, I love this slide because I use it a lot with my patients. Because it talks about how our food can speak to our genes. And that if you eat something that's anti-inflammatory, right, like some of the fruits and vegetables we've been talking about, it will talk to our DNA and it will give you or cause an anti-inflammatory response. But if, on the other hand, you eat something that's like a food allergen or is a toxin, it is also going to talk to your DNA. But it's going to form these complexes that can then promote or cause inflammation. So it's, it's a way to explain how it happens, but also, too, how you could reverse it. And I think exercise is really important to address, is when you're trying to detoxify, and I believe, especially women, we should be doing this every day, is to do some lymph drainage, especially around our breasts, because where is the most common place where we find breast cancer in our breasts? Upper outer, right? which is an, an area that there's not necessarily a lot going on in terms of really helping the lymph circulation. So I think we should all be doing massages when you're in the shower to go all the way around your breasts and really help get the lymph mo moving. And then using things like uh, bathing in magnesium-rich sea salt and using a, uh, a brush, or you could, which you can even do dry brushing. 
And sleep and relaxation I already talked about. You can also use bowel binders. I tend to use more um, fiber. And then sweating and hydrotherapy, you know, I really believe in the far infrared sauna. I think you have to be careful when you're using it that you're also giving patients enough antioxidants. And how important our eliminating through the skin is with dry brushing. And you can do some sweat therapy, but also even in the shower, you know, where you're doing your lymph drainage, you can also be doing sweat therapy at the same time. And don't forget the, the bile. You know, we tend to forget how important bile is, and especially where you can recirculate your toxins from the bile to, or from the gallbladder to the gut and back. There's this whole enterohepatic recirculation. And you can do a pretty thorough detox program, and if you don't address what's going on in the bile or in the fat, you still can be circulating a lot of toxins. So there's some nutrients that are really important for bile flow that I think should be included. And also, too, don't forget about your probiotics and that there's labs you can follow. And this is a very basic program that I'm going through, but of course, you, know, you can work with your doctor to develop a more direct one for whatever your problem is. And I already talked about magnesium, but whenever we're stressed, we lose magnesium. We lose a lot of magnesium, we lose the B vitamins, we lose vitamin C, so it's important to put those back in, as well as CoQ10 and really feed your mitochondria. And use something, I really like bifunctional modulators. So what's a bifunctional modulator? Well, we have two main detoxification pathways in our liver in other parts of our body, but liver being the main detoxification organ is where I'm gonna focus. So phase one and phase two. So basically phase one makes things more water soluble, right? But if you make something more water soluble, you actually change it, you make it a more reactive intermediate. And if you don't have phase two support, if you're not then able to process that further and get it out of your body, you're actually making things worse. So you wanna make sure that you're working on phase one, but you're particularly working on phase two. So bifunctional modulators are things that do both, and they're found in nature, like chlorophyllin, for example. So if you can use as much of that, just adding it to your diet, you're already working on detoxification. And we, and we have studies on how good uh, chlorophyllin is and how it can work, especially against you know, some dietary toxins. And so it's a very busy slide, but it's just to show you some of the important antioxidants that you need for phase one of the liver. And then you also will go through one for phase two. So these would be like your polyphenols, your green tea, your pomegranate, raspberry, you know, artichoke, all things you can use in your food. It's important to continue those because they're also needed for phase two. But then in phase two, you also need a lot of, of some of the amino acids like glycine and taurine and n acetylcysteine. And so it's really important that we don't fast to detox, which I know there's a lot of people out there that believe you can do that. Uh, but you can also get yourself very sick doing that. So you really need amino acids for phase two because detoxification is very energy dependent. And it especially needs amino acids to process that phase two. And so in some patients, you may need more phase two um, support. But whatever you do, the important thing is that you monitor. You do it through your clinical evaluation. You can use questionnaires. I told you about bioimpedance analysis. And also that you follow it with your laboratory. And that you can do most of these things I talked about for yourself. But if you need further detoxification, I think it really needs to be personalized to you and what's going on in your body. And it's important to whatever you start to track your symptoms and really look at how well you're doing, but also to what are you going to do long term to avoid this toxic world that we unfortunately all live in. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. And I really do believe a detoxification program is necessary. Because of time, we're going to, and we do have another speaker, we're going to um, just have um, a few minutes for questions um, just about, um, uh, just about uh, uh, five to eight minutes. So, um, questions, yes. You mentioned, Doctor, the uh, study in PubMed at the very beginning. Could you tell me again that study that was available in PubMed? Uh, the one from the CDC? Yes. You'll get it. I'm happy to send it to you too if you give me your email address. I'll take my phone and bring it back to you. 
Yeah, doctor. Uh, how much do you contribute to indoor exposure in relation to toxins? And the next uh, question I had on top of that is, we develop covalent bonding zeolites that take the paint from 540 parts per million to 120 parts per billion. And we're doing a lot of that research right now, which has proven out to be conclusive. Uh, 66 is your outdoor exposure on a parts per million, and the inside house is average about seven, 800 parts per billion on VOCs. Any comments on that relative to sleeping patterns? And Because I didn't hear you say much about indoor exposure. Yeah, I, I know actually, I actually purposely didn't say a lot about indoor exposure because I just recently found out just how much higher it is. And, and it's not just, you know, I've always talked to my patients about getting rid of carpet as much as you can and trying to use um, wood. Of course, you're going to get some exposures from that as well. But you know, my main focus has been to try and limit as much as you can, open your doors, you have good ventilation. But also, I did mention I, I use a lot of indoor um, sort of ionizers or um, air filters. But I was, actually, I was actually looking for a better one. I mean, I have four in my house, but I've been sort of looking. There has to be something better. So I'm interested to find out more about yours because I don't know. Yeah, but I think that's extremely important, and especially when you're living in a colder climate. You know, I, I work in, in Capitola, but I actually, half of the week, I live in the Central Valley where it's much colder. And so during the wintertime, you know, you're practically indoor um, most of the time, although, you know, I like to go outside a lot. Uh, but that just makes me think, you know, when you're, you're, ha you're having off-gassing from some of your uh, carpets or what have you, right? You have stuff from your paint. You are cooking, so you have some toxins from that, right? And you wet on that very poor circulation. And then also, too, you know, there's people in the house, you're bringing things in with your, you know, from your shoes and um, toxins from the outside. That just really adds up to the toxin load. So I think that becomes much more important. How can you get rid of the fluoride in the water? I was told that just filtering it doesn't. I believe it. I'm not may not be the best person to to say to say this, but I believe it depends on the type of filter you know that you have. Um, I, for me, it's important to use a filter to get rid of the fluoride. But I also think that fluoride really counteracts um, iodine, and so it's important to bring iodine into your diet and I really believe in doing it more through food uh, because we know that there, you can have certain health problems where too much iodine are, is going to make it even worse. So I believe in doing it two ways, filtering your water but then also trying to increase iodine by eating things you know like wakame and seafood and as much sea vegetables as you can. Thank you. Hi, and I also have a question about the smart meter. I Yesterday I found out we have like live in townhouse, like four or five, right behind our bedroom. And uh, do you have any comment? How well, we can... What you can do for it? Yeah. Um, there's more and more um, different things out there. I've particularly been interested in the ones that were developed by Dr. Sinatra. So Stephen Sinatra is a cardiologist, but uh, I believe about eight years ago, his son became very ill, and it turned out he went to all the best doctors, and he has access to the best in the world, and they could not find out what was wrong with him. And it turned out that it was due to electromagnetic radiation. So his latest book called Grounding is about that. And he talks about how important it is for us to receive earth, electrons from the Earth. So basically, the, the Earth is a big electron donor. So it's really important that you do something every day that helps you ground. And in order to do that, you have to have contact with concrete or with the earth without shoes on. And you should use shoes that are, rubber, that are not rubber-soled, for example. If they're leather-soled, you, you still can get electrons. But I think it starts with that, with you know, just making sure you're grounding every day. And then there are different things you can use in your home to help that. Now, in his book, he talks about that. And he has this whole fancy way to, to one of the persons you co-wrote the book with. And then I believe on his web website, SinatraSolution.com, he actually has um, some meters that you can read just how much exposure you're having, and then also some blockers that you can use in addition to doing the grounding and that sort of thing. Uh, it's called grounding? No, it's called earthing. It's called earthing by Stephen Sinatra. Earthing, E-A-R-T-H-I-N-G. And you can get it, I believe you can get it on Amazon. Actually, I learned it from Evelyn 
Yeah, and I think it should be every day. And if you don't have grass, I, I go on the earth. You know, just, you know, the earth, you can, if it's raining and you can't do that, yeah. concrete is the next best thing. It's not as good. Really being on the earth is the best. And it doesn't take, you know, if you do it for three minutes a day, it doesn't take much. And I think, too, it's really important that when you do something like that, you do it with intent. You know, you have intention. And your intention is that you're standing there and your body is just absorbing all those electrons. I think it's important to do both. Yeah? Oh, I, I've got the microphone. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, um, so my question is about um, the things from the sea. What about the radioactivity? That's what really stops me at this point. Yeah, it does me too. And I work with an oncologist who was actually uh, doing some of the readings, you know, after all the um, problems that happened. And his belief is that you can add um, other foods that will help with the radioactivity. Now that's something that he's actually working on studying exactly what is the best. Uh, I've been using chlorella a lot. The problem with chlorella is you want to make sure that where you're getting it from doesn't have cyanobacteria because now cyanobacteria has been linked to neuro uh, diseases such as Parkinson's and MS. But there are some labs out there where you can get it um, where there are, you know, they test for it. And you can always also, you know, test yourself. But you're right, it seems like everything is always a balance because you, can, you also have to worry about mercury and other things. But I think we, if we try to get the, the, the best source that we can, and then we try to balance by doing a little bit of everything, and you increase your antioxidant as much as you can, which, in, which you're going to have to supplement. And I, I believe especially trying to increase your glutathione levels is crucial. And then getting as much other antioxidants as you can, whether it's, you know, it's vitamin C or vitamin E, and getting them also from foods high in those, because I think there are things in nature that we have not been able to say that we don't know that are synergistic, you know, that work together to help our body absorb or even work better. Doctor, do you or does your institute test for dioxin? And if you do, are you able from those tests to detect the amount of dioxin toxicity? And since you are in functional medicine, are you able to, with that information, link it directly to diseases such as Parkinson's, Raynaud's, um, and neuropathy, and, and make that statement in writing, it is unconscionable that the VA does not have an immunologist nor a toxicologist. I'm, I'm really desperate to know. Um, I do test for as much as I can, um, but one thing I do, if there's some toxins that we're not able to, to still, um, to test for, uh, what I also do is I test someone's genes to see how susceptible are they. Did they um, inherit or develop a genetic mutation? It's actually a SNP. It's a, it's a single nucleotide polymorphism. That's what SNP stands for where they're more susceptible to that. Because I think that the big problem with toxins, and there was a, a paper that was actually just released in um, December 28th, it's not, it's, it was just the, the draft that's, that's available, is how things work together, that it may be more than just one toxin. And when you look at someone's genetic susceptibility, if they have, happen to have more than one of those genetic single nucleotide polymorphisms, that it's together that can cause you to be more susceptible or not be able to process it as well. And so I think you need to be aware of both in order to try and detox someone. And yes, I have dioxin, for example, I don't have a lot of experience with. I have experience with other toxins that I've tested my patients and worked on, especially on uh, Parkinson's. I happen to have a lot of Parkinson's patients. And I agree with you. I think it's really important to be able to look at levels, but also really look at how can I help the body fight it better? How can I help the body? What is the body missing that I can do? Because as I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we have Bruce Thames, for example, who sort of devoted his whole life to looking at what is genetics, what's the environment, and what genetics you have inherited that maybe don't help you detoxify this. How can we bypass that and help it? But more or less the link that caused it and, and also, um, is there anyone in your group that does work with dioxin toxicity, the, um, especially if someone knows that they've had stomach surgery and they've removed tumor that contains dioxin or others that have the diseases that are listed on the association? Yeah. Yeah. I've worked with some of those, but actually the person that I think would be better suited to do that is John Klein. 
He's actually out of Vancouver. He's one of the main professors for the Institute of Functional Medicine, and his whole thing is toxins. He's C or K? It's uh, C, C L E I N. And uh, I'm trying to I remember the, the name of his book, Detox. Detox Now. I can't remember, but if you Google John Klein, and I'm happy to give you his number if you need it to. I would like that. Thank you. Mimicker. Actually, thank you for saying that because I had forgotten. I just read an article about endometriosis and dioxin and how it was linked to, uh, is particularly evident in women, because there's been uh, quite a few studies on endometriosis and they've been very conflicting on whether or not it is really toxin related. This was the best studied uh, that's ever come out and it was talking about how it's particularly um, happening in women who would have a phase one and a phase two uh, mutation in their detoxification pathways and they actually isolated the two that then allowed them to be more, sus more susceptible and then the problem is that they already cannot detoxify hormones and then you add dioxin on top of it and it becomes a problem where they can't detoxify any of them and then they, be they become estrogen dominant and they will develop estrogen um, cancers that are related to the, to the estrogen too. So, Not to add insult to injury but well, I want to uh, thank you, Dr. Trindade, for an excellent lecture.